welcome to chapter 19 of the Silver Sword, the Bavarian Farmer. There were queer no noises in the barn, louder than the scaring of rats or the creaking of rusty hinges in the wind. The farmer flung the door open and shouted, Come out here, you young devil. I heard you. you can't you imitate a rat better than that? He stood still, accustoming his eyes to the half-darkness of the barn. The sun rose early enough in July, but it was not full daylight yet, and all he could see was the vague blur of hay. While he listened, everything was so quiet that he began to wonder if he had been mistaken. Then the sound of a half-sob stifled immediately confirmed his suspicions. Come out, he shouted. Do I smoke you out like rabbits or fetch the prong? The threats were ineffective, so he went off to fetch the prong. Soon the hay was flying, and something else came flying too. An overripe turnip, which beautifully aimed, struck the farmer full in the nape of the neck, he swore. An anxious voice popped up. We give in, please put that horrible thing away before it goes right through Bronia. And the farmer turned around, his prong poised in mid-air to find himself face to face with a tall, thin girl, her clothes and hair bristling with bits of hay. We only spent the night here. We haven't done any harm. When she realised that he had not properly understood, Ruth called Eric. The hay at the farmer's feet parted and Eric's spluttering face appeared. He had held his breath all too long and made a dive for the open air, clinging to the handle of the barn door while he coughed the chaff out of his lungs. Hey, that's me you're stepping on, shrilled Bronia, as she emerged from under the farmer's left foot. And when she saw the murderous prong, she flew to Ruth and hid behind her. Eric, tell him we only spent a night here, and we haven't done any harm, said Ruth, with one arm around Bronia. Eric translated. No harm, exclaimed the farmer, removing a splodgy mess from the inside of his shirt collar. I suppose you call this a birthday present. One, two, three of you. Is that the lot, or have we another batch lurking somewhere? The reply was another wet turnip. It landed in exactly the same spot as before. The last member of the family, who was certainly no diplomat, had launched his second missile. Now he came sliding down from the top of the hay for no other reason than he had run out of ammunition. Bronia giggled. Eric grinned, but Ruth was angry. When will you grow up, you silly little boy, she said, seizing him by the shoulders and shaking him like a puppy. You spoil everything for us. I wish we'd left you in Warsaw. Jan, who had as usual acted from the highest of motives, began to protest. Don't go for me, Ruth. I haven't stolen anything. The larder window was open all night and I could have taken anything I wanted, but I didn't. You know I didn't. Go to your knees and apologise, said Ruth. He didn't go to his knees, but he did mutter that he was sorry. And the farmer, who had now removed most of the traces of bomb damage from his neck, and was almost ready to see the funny side of the situation, was gracious enough to take the apology in good part. Now, Mr Interpreter, said the farmer to Eric, Perhaps you'll be good enough to explain your presence here. Briefly, Eric told him who they were, where they came from, and where they were going to, and why they had not, as they usually did, asked permission to last night to sleep in the barn. They had arrived after dark and had not liked to disturb their household. We were willing to pay for our night's lodgings with a day's work, he finished. Of course, said the farmer, and if I'm not satisfied with you, I'll hand you into the burgomaster. What's a burgomaster, said Bronia, when Eric had interpreted. And from now on, he had to explain everything, for the farmer knew little Polish. The burgomaster, my dear, is a nasty bogeyman who plagues everyone beyond endurance. He'd be particularly interested in you. You're Poles, aren't you? Well, there's an order gone out from the military government that all Poles in the area are to be rounded up and sent back to Poland. It's the burgomaster's job to see that the order is obeyed. We've just come from Poland. We're not going back, said Ruth. We're going to Switzerland to find our father and mother, said Bronia. 
Nothing on earth would send me back to Poland, said Eric. Nor me, said Jan. That's what you think. But if the military government decide you must go back, back you go, my lad. And neither rotten turnips nor anything else will save you, said the farmer. Now come along and have a bit of breakfast. There were window boxes on the sills of the farmhouse pretty with flowers. On the scrub table the in the kitchen, a breakfast of coffee and rolls for two had been laid. Emma called the farmer. Four visitors for breakfast, four tattered bundles of mischief from Poland, Ruth, Eric, Jan and Bronia. They've walked all the way especially to meet us. This is Frau Wolf, my wife. She speaks Polish. Learned it from two Poles we had working during the war. A plump and comfortable looking lady shook hands with them. In turn, and welcomed them to the table, went to fetch more breakfast. From now on, what with her knowledge of Polish and edicts of German, the conversation ran quite smoothly. What's that mess on your collar, Kurt? she asked when she came back. A present from Poland, said the farmer, winking at Jan. And when Edict translated, they all laughed so much that they nearly spilt the coffee. It was a clean shirt this morning, she complained. Then I shall ask Jan to wash it for me, just to show my appreciation. That's a wonderful idea, said Ruth. No doubt Jan would have thought of it himself, only I bet him to it, said the farmer, winking at Ruth. Jan has plenty of ideas, but not that sort, said Ruth. Eat all you can, said Frau Wolf, depositing more, depositing a plate of rolls on the table. There's plenty more when you finish this slot. Baronia's eyes were wide with astonishment. Never had she seen so much food. This is a farm, you know, Frau Wolf explained. There's no salt shortage. The family were content. You have made us so welcome, said Ruth. I feel somehow as if you've been expecting us. Oh, you get to expect anything in these parts, said the farmer between gulps of coffee. The woods are full of refugees like yourselves, you know. You're not by any means the first lot I've found in the barn. Last winter, I found a whole family in the cow shed, curled around the cow to keep warm. Told me they'd walked all the way from the Ukraine. Didn't believe a word of it, of course. If you ask me, they just footed it from the next village, a stunt to get a free meal. I made them work for it, though. We've had dozens and dozens of refugees working here at one time or another. Got rid of them all now, thank the Lord. Now the military government send us nothing but German prisoners of war. And they're worse. The government want to turn us into an agricultural country. Holy onions, did you ever see such no hear such nonsense? As if you could ever teach a mechanic how to milk a cow. He would try it with a spanner if you didn't tell him how. The farmer rambled on like this for some time, munching great mouthfuls of bread between whiles and washing it down with cascades of coffee. Eric was the only one who bothered to listen, and when at last the farmer came to a full stop, he said, I worked on a German farm during the war, but I hated every moment. The people weren't decent like you. The farmer appeared to take this harmless observation as an insult. You think I'm decent, do you? Just wait till you I've wrung a day's work out of you. You'll think very differently then. We'll start right now, soon as you've done eating. Let them rest today, Kurt, said his wife. They're all, all of them worn out. The farmer thumped the table with his fist. I don't believe in treating people soft, he said. Treat them rough and they'll respect you. Give them the milk of kindness and it'll turn sour. No, they'll start right now. Ruth and Jan shall come with me to the hayfield and there'll be no lunch for them if they slack off. Brony can feed the hens and Eric, Eric shall stay in the kitchen to help me, said his wife. He looks as if a breeze would snuff him out. He shall stay and peel potatoes for me. That is, if you'd care to. And the look she gave her husband made it quite clear that she intended to have her own way on this matter. Yarn, you rascal. Don't imagine I'll let you forget my shirt, said the farmer, thumping the table as fierce, so fiercely that the crockery jumped. And as far as Yarn was concerned, the farmer had his way. But really short lot of activities today. So this is another one of those good days to go back and fix up or have an attempt at some of the creative activities that you haven't done yet. I would be expecting every year eight student 
to go back and have a go at those activities. Okay, so uh, just five questions to do for today's chapter, and then any fix-ups or anything that you need to do. Uh, have a great day. Look forward to seeing your work. Uh, don't forget that uh, Mr. Frank, Mrs. Gasson, and myself are, are pretty much tied up all day, uh, so I won't get to doing um, much of your marking until uh, later in the evening. Um, have a great day, but don't forget to send in your work. See you soon.